Hello and welcome to News Click. A recently leaked research paper of Google made the claim that Google has achieved quantum supremacy through its quantum computer Sika Moore. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkayasta. So Prabir, first can you tell us more about what this quantum computer Sika Moore was able to achieve? What does quantum supremacy mean? And does this mean we're in a new age of computing? Well, we're certainly in the age of new age of computing as well. But it is not that all the old computers now we have to throw away. It's not that vacuum tubes were superseded by transistors, then by what would be called solid state uh, devices. That is not what is happening. We have a different class of computers which have now come into being, what is we call quantum computers. And quantum supremacy is a very narrow and restricted definition. All it means is that quantum computer should be able to do one computation, one computation for a specifically designed problem, which is faster than what a classical computer can do. Hmm. And it has shown, yes, it can do so. It's a 53 qubit, and we'll talk about what a qubit is as opposed to a bit. Qubit computer, the Google's Sycamore, and it has computed a specific problem in about 200 seconds which would take a classical supercomputer, a supercomputer working on classical mm. physics, it would take 10,000 years. So that, yes, in this sense, quantum supremacy has been satisfied because that's all it was designed to be. Mm. One problem to be solved faster than a supercomputer and a specifically designed problem. But of course, there's a huge set of technical challenges doing even this uh, kind of test. Mm. And this is the first test that a, a quantum computer has passed doing this kind of computation. So I think a huge step, yes, showing that quantum computers are possible, but what class of problem they will solve, that is still an open issue. And when we, where and when can we apply them and what kind of environment will do need and can it be something that we can put in our rooms and around our wrists, carry in our pockets, which we do for all computers as we know that the cell phone today is more powerful than hmm. what used to be considered an almost a supercomputer, say, the 20, 25 years back. So I think those are the kind of issues that we will need to address. So what is the difference between a quantum computer and a classical computer in terms of uh, the way they, they are built, the way they, are, they function? It's a good question. And I'm not sure that I or anybody can answer that question very easily. Because as Feynman said, we do not understand what really the quantum the world is. The physics of the quantum world is not something we can understand because we are not in the quantum world. Hmm. We are in our world which takes over from the atomic uh, atom and outward, so to hmm. say. So the quantum effects, which are really subatomic effects, are not realized. We, are not, we don't understand what it is because we are not in that world. So the quantum world, as we now know, has a lot of properties which are not, uh, what we shall we say, not really explicable to us because mm. we cannot have those properties in our world. Mm. One is the principle of what is called superposition, mm. that an electron can be in two states apparently simultaneously unless it is measured. When it is measured, it's only in one state. Okay, it collapses to one state or the other. When it is not measured, which is not observed in the terms of quantum mechanics, then it can be in either up state or down state, which means it could be in two states. In fact, the argument is it is in both states. Okay, yeah. and it only when it's observed, the states collapse to one. Now, we are not going to get into what this is because it's not about quantum mechanics, but what it does for a quantum computer. The second phenomena, which has also been well known, which is what's called entanglement, hmm. that two electrons are entangled with each other in a way that even if they're separated at a distance, they still continue to be entangled and they share shall we say, opposite properties. If one is up, the other one will be down. Mm -hmm. So complementarity will be shared across these two electrons, which are entangled. Now, this is also what is used. So we get what are what would be called bits in the computing world. Instead of that, in the quantum world, you would call them qubits, mm -hmm. which therefore have these properties of superposition and entanglement. And this allows you, as Feynman had, Professor Feynman had predicted, this allows you to set up problems 
which classical computers cannot solve because they need to deal with very large numbers of probabilities and mm -hmm. dealing them with the, in the classical world means very long computations. It could be, it does, in this case, 10,000 years was mm -hmm. the calculation that was uh, supposed to be if it was done on a classical computer. But because the quantum world is probabilistic and the qubits therefore deal with the probabilistic world inherently, Therefore, they have the ability to compute these things much faster. And the interesting part is as you go up qubits, the number of qubits increase, your computational power increases exponentially. Yes. And therefore, you have the ability to crack very large problems in a short phase of time. So there are three problems that the quantum computers really faced. What is what is called classical error correction. We know that computers need error correction hmm. and you need to check, check errors. So how does errors propagate? The second was, will it last for enough time? So this, this was the second issue. And the third was, was there a credible problem which could be solved and we know the answer is correct. Hmm. So the third one is being checked out. Is the answer being correct? And supercomputers are being used to check the results. But the other two tests, it has passed. It has shown, yes, it could be done for 200 seconds. And it seems error correction did work. Hmm. And they did have error correction in this 53 qubit machine, which uh, Google has produced. So I think we would say we are two and a half uh, were, you know, times sure that it's okay. We needed to have a number of three, all these three conditions satisfied to say yes, it is true. But it looks like that the third condition that it is, hmm. that it was the correct answer is also probably true. And uh, the reason that the paper probably has not been published as yet is they're waiting to verify the results before they publish it. So that it's it's going to obviously come in a major science journal. But that's the reason it's been held up. So I would say yes, in the narrow definition of quantum supremacy, this rule has shown. And of course, there are a lot of other companies in the race, but it has shown. And I think it's a very significant achievement because it shows, yes, quantum computers can really solve problems. The sort of threats quantum computing poses to the kind of digital security measures we have in place right now. So can you tell us about that? Well, there, there is somebody called uh, Professor Shore who so showed that essentially what we have as the uh, most common cryptographic measure, the public private key, hmm. that you have two very large uh, numbers, uh, prime numbers, which you multiply. And uh, while if you have the keys, the, it, 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 if, it, if you don't have the keys, it's difficult to crack it by just looking at the number and using brute force methods. Hmm. So the question, the answer was to put the public key in the, a key in public domain and retain your private key. And then when people would send you after uh, coding it using your public key, would send you the message, you could factor it because you had the uh, private. Pub, private key. This kind of encryption Shore had shown quantum computing will crack, hmm. okay? But we are not there yet. Let's be very clear that what we have seen as a particular problem which has been solved, this is not Shore's algorithm. And even if the Shore's algorithms or other algorithms are found to break this, it looks like it could be decades away. Hmm. It could be five years away. We don't know. But at the moment, it doesn't look like this uh, cryptography is uh, under threat as it is being talked about. But yes, in a, some future date, we don't know when, this cryptography is going to fail. Okay, that is almost sure. So we have to move to more uh, secure cryptographic measures, which are quantum hack proof. And those are being worked on at the moment. So your entire digital infrastructure, the internet protocols, it will hmm. be built on those rather than the current cryptographic measures. But I, I, you know, I would also still uh, leave one danger that we would have. It is that existing whatever we have encrypted, which is available today, yeah. because people think that if it's encrypted, it can be public, uh, nobody can really read it. Those, all those documents will then be readable. Hmm. So whatever is currently encrypted, if it is available, that day, all this will become publicly available in uncrypted form. And there are dangers, therefore, of the Bitcoin blockchain kind of systems, which cannot retrospectively now recode hmm. their cryptographic algorithm. So I think this does pose a real problem for Bitcoin kind of systems, 
which anyway have never been real money but have been something else. So I think those kind of systems are definitely at risk. Therefore, yes, some things will be at risk. But fortunately, most of the things we deal with, and as you know, secrets are no longer secrets after 20 years, those hopefully will not have major repercussions. Mm -hmm. But certainly the cryptographic world is going to change in the near, in the future. We don't know in the near future or decades in the future. That's an open question. And finally, uh, what are the challenges in the development of, super, uh, of quantum computers and where do we, where do different countries stand in uh, achieving the development of quantum well, computers? Let's put it, there are various aspects of quantum uh, applications of quantum computers and larger issue of how to apply quantum effects itself. So you have quantum communication, you have quantum devices. These are also being worked on. They share certain similarities, but they're not ident identical to quantum computers. So you're really talking about a whole field which has to advance, mm -hmm. not just quantum computers. So you, you have to invest in this entire field of physics and its applications in terms of technology. So I think quantum technology, if it has to advance, mm -hmm. it needs money, it needs people. And you cannot have people unless you have an infrastructure because you're dealing with some almost near zero temperatures within which these quantum computers are created and these qubits exist. That also for a brief period of time. Hmm. So you're really talking about technological advances and huge investments in technology in order to have either the quantum effects be visible or quantum computers do computations or to have quantum communication, which is secure communication and uh, which Chinese seem to have shown. So all of this needs, as I said, capital and human beings. So if you take money at the moment, China and the US are far ahead. They're investing in the excess of uh, the last two, two, two or two and a half years, three years. Both of them have been spending roughly the amount of $10 billion to $12 billion, each of these countries. All others, if you take European Union put together, it would be probably somewhere near 1 billion, 1.5 billion in the same period. So about 10 to 15 percent of what each China and the United States is spending. India is spending just about 1 percent of that. We have an 80 crore program, it's 110 million dollars roughly, and that's spent over three years. So that's really nothing. We have a three qubit machine at the moment. China has shown a 24 qubit machine. The US 50, 60, 70, mm. they're talking about that range. So we are really way, way behind. behind. So not even, at the moment, we're not even in the race. Forget mm. about uh, being in, the, in, in there. So I think it is something which at the moment seems to be a two horse race between China and the United States. The United States is still ahead in terms of functional uh, qubit sized devices. But China is producing more papers and is also seems to be also having more patents and they have a broader focus in quantum communication they seem to be more advanced mm. than what the US has done. So if you put all of it together I will say at the moment it seems to be a two horse race and if com com countries like India want to be even remotely in the race then the kind of money we are spending and the kind of infrastructure we have is not even sufficient to uh, have a toe in the door. Hmm. So I think that's something that we have to think about. Do we want to be in the game or shall we decide that we are not in the game, we'll align with one or the other by the technology which the government seems to believe that it can do and then be dependent on others forever. So thank you Prabir for joining us for this discussion and that's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching News Clip.